what are boundaries and why do we need them? Let's finish the year strong. Hey ladies, I'm back and this is the Mamas in Control podcast. I'm Heather Chauvet and we have a few weeks left of 2021. It's go time. So every single day you're going to hear a podcast from me. This podcast are tips, tricks, strategies, clips from inside of our mastery and our mastery business coaching experience. We talk about parenting. We talk about emotional health. We talk about managing our energy and our time. But more importantly, this is about how we show up in the world. We all know who we want to become. We know what we don't want in our lives. Therefore, we know what we do want in our lives. And sometimes figuring that out That's where the magic happens. When we know how to master our fear, master our guilt, master our resistance, and not push through it, this is not about burnout. It's not about hustling. This is about showing up, shifting our identity, and showing up in a way that feels aligned and alive with the life that we want to be living. Whether it's at home or in your career, you could work in corporate, you could be a business owner, whoever you are in the world, you are ready to make a bigger impact. You are ready to feel alive. So if you are somebody who's been following me for a while and waiting until we open the doors to our coaching programs, now is the time. We are doing our interviews for 2022 start dates. So head on over to Heather chauvin.com forward slash mastery. Heather Chauvin, C-H-A-U-V-I-N.com forward slash mastery. And if you are interested in our mastery business coaching experience, this is for women, professional women who are either trying to leave corporate and want to market their skills. You are a badass and you know, you know you're good at it, but you just have no idea how to do marketing or sales. Check out our mastery business experience. That's Heather Chauvin, C-H-A-U-V-I-N.com forward slash business. And maybe you have no desire to start a business, or maybe you don't own a business and you are just incredibly overwhelmed and you have no idea where to start. And the thought of entering a longer term program, whether it's eight months with a big investment, feels really overwhelming to you. That's why this year we decided to open the doors for the first time ever publicly for our Mastery Jumpstart Experience. This is a two-month container of space helping you start to get the engine going, creating that momentum for you. So you get everything that we give our students inside of our mastery experience. You get a mentor, you get access to me, you get the modules, you get the live calls, And it's only two months, which means it's a fraction of the investment as well. So if you've been hanging out a while and you've been wanting to work with me, but have, you're like, holy crap, how am I going to make this happen? Now is the time. But here's the trick. The doors do close at the end of December and we will not be opening them again for Mastery Jumpstart until the spring. So now is the time to join us and book that call. So head on over to Heather Chauvin, C-H-A-U-V-I-N.com forward slash mastery. You have one life and so many opportunities to change the trajectory of how you feel and what your future looks like. Now is the time to take that action. Heather Chauvin.com forward slash mastery. Do not pass up this opportunity. Once the doors are closed, they will be closed until the spring. All right, let's dive into today's podcast. Hey everyone, I am super excited to share with you Terry Cole. I've been following Terry for years and I am so incredibly grateful to have this opportunity to talk with her. Terry is a licensed psychotherapist, global relationship and empowerment expert, the author of Boundary Boss, The Essential Guide to True or Talk True, Be Seen, and Finally Live Free. I'm telling you right now, you need to go out and get Boundary Boss. Terry is the boss of boundaries. That's what I need to say about that. 
Um, For over two decades, she's worked with a diverse group of clients that included everyone from stay-at-home moms to celebrities and Fortune 500 CEOs. Um, She has a gift for making complex psychological concepts accessible and actionable so that clients and students achieve sustainable change. Uh, She inspires over 250,000 people weekly through her blog, social media, signature courses, and her popular podcast, The Terry Cole Show. All right, we're going to dive into boundaries. I know they're complicated, you don't understand them, and you find them emotionally uncomfortable. So let's dive in. Hi, Terry. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Heather. I'm so psyched to be here. I am so looking forward to this conversation. I don't know if many people get very excited about talking about boundaries, but it brings <laughs> me joy. It brings me so much joy, as I'm sure it does you. Mm-hmm. Um, and for those that don't know you, just give them a little, the quick backstory, and then we'll go more into this conversation. But this is one that every single woman listening to this podcast or who follows me needs to listen to this again and again and again. <laughs> um, well, my backstory with boundaries or professionally, I guess professionally, I've been a psychotherapist for almost 25 years. And why boundaries or why why my interest in this is just from my own personal experience of being a boundary disaster and how much pain and complications that caused in my young life and I was um also I was also a talent agent negotiating contracts for supermodels and celebrities before I became a psychotherapist so I was on my own psychological journey in therapy and realizing how bad my boundaries were. And then I was in this entertainment business, which, you know, not exactly a hotbed of mental health when it comes to boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then when I became a psychotherapist, I just could not believe the epidemic Mm -hmm. of disordered boundaries and how complicated it made life and how much pain it was causing my clients. And so that was sort of the beginning where I realized there was such a deep need for a comprehensive guide for women in particular to master this art of boundaries. It's like mastering a language that nobody taught us, but that we really need to know. Yeah. And I love that you talk about it as a language and an art because it's a skill and it needs to be practiced and not, and just molded. Right. So can you talk about yourself or what you maybe it might be easier for you to see someone that you're last time you had a conversation with someone when someone has that light bulb moment of I don't have boundaries or I don't know how to implement boundaries. What does that look like in someone's life? A ton of frustration. I mean, that's really what it looks like is people, you know, my clients would come in and have a lot of like, I can't believe how entitled this person is. I'm so mad at how inconsiderate this person is. And I would always come back to, well, did you let them know how you feel? Did you have the conversation? Did you make a simple request about what you would like instead? And the answer was usually, well, no, they should, they should know. They should know. Trust me. She knew I was mad. I'm like, Trust me, she actually didn't specifically know what you were mad about. And so the frustration and the feeling put upon, right, feeling undervalued is the thing that I would see over and over again. And I would always say, hey, this is an indication that boundaries are being violated. So if anyone is listening and is like, I don't know about my boundaries, you can literally stop right now and take a resentment inventory. Mm -hmm. Ooh, so good. Resentment inventory. Mm -hmm. So how do we, uh, when someone's listening to this and we see modern culture, we see culture and what is appropriate. Resentment, anger, frustration, blaming our children, blaming our partners, blaming everybody else uh, for our lack of fill in the blank. So how do you move from blaming the way things are to, I can be emotionally free. 
Well, it's just one step at a time. And part of it is don't feel bad that you don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. You can learn how to do this. This is my passion is teaching people how to do this. So you can learn. And I think that you don't have to make others wrong either. You, it's really about, are you willing to put in the energy and the effort to create your own liberation? Because when you are fluent, in the language of boundaries, when you understand why you relate to boundaries the way that you do. And I think, you know, Heather, it'd be helpful just to establish quickly, what is my definition, my definition of having healthy boundaries? Mm -hmm. It really is your own personal rules of engagement, right? It's the rules, the limits, the guidelines that we set. It's letting others know what's okay with you and what is not okay with you regularly, right? Sharing your preferences, desires, limits, and deal breakers. I, you know, I broke it down into categories. You have to have the ability to communicate your preferences, your desires, your limits, and your deal breakers. And you have to be willing to do it because when you, it's one thing to think it, you know, and it's a whole other ball of wax to actually say it. Right. Can we talk about the thinking versus saying? <laughs> I call it the brave zone when you're just jumping in and you're like in the deep end and you're like, can I, can I swim? I don't <laughs> Um, But the transition between that, because that's where transformation happens. Well, the transition is that you have to get into a learning curve. You actually have to put in the time to learn the language, to realize when you do a resentment inventory, you, and you know, I mean, listen, it would take you, anybody listening, two seconds. If I was like, who are you holding some resentment against right now? Mm. You would literally be able to write the list in 2.2 seconds. Because the truth is, you do know who you're feeling either underappreciated by or who you're feeling let down by or who you're angry at. And it's really important that you don't walk around with that low-grade aggression Mm -hmm. because it really does, you know, it's an energetic thing. It really does impact you. So once you establish, well, the people who I have resentment for, because a lot of times it's like the same four people who were endlessly pissed off at, you know, mm -hmm. um, and they're the ones that we don't, we don't say anything to. And I think that the transition that you're talking about, the way that I teach it in the book and in a course that I teach on this is that we have to know ourselves first. There's a deep dive into us and our relationship to ourselves and understanding that you relate to boundaries specifically the way that you do in a very unique way for a million good reasons. You know, we all have what I call a downloaded boundary blueprint. Mm. And this is what you learned in your family of origin, the country, the culture that you grew up in, the gender norms, the things that were expected of you. Most of us as women were raised and praised for being self-abandoning codependents. Amen. So, you know what I mean? Like that's literally what people wanted from us was for us to be good girls. Yeah. Don't rock the boat. Don't be a troublemaker. Don't be rude. The, the highest in my growing up, the most important thing was to be nice and to be perceived as being nice, which meant nobody taught me how to set boundaries, right? Because that would be being a bully or being mean. And all of those are myths, of course, because that's not true. But you have, it, we can't just go from not saying anything or expressing ourselves in a passive aggressive way right? We might slam the door instead of saying something. We might send a passive aggressive smiley, you know, at the end of a text to our friend to let them know that we're annoyed. We're like, but you know, okay. So, but whatever works for you, smiley face or love you after you've said something that, you know, implies that you're pissed, but it's all of this beating around the bush. So there, there's a whole process that goes on sort of before you take the action to make the simple request or, you know, m you know, set the limit with the person, wh whatever your situation might be. And I think that understanding 
that not setting boundaries, you know, we were, we were sold this bill of goods that by being really nice, by acquiescing to what other people want, by not really standing up and asserting ourselves in a way, being there for everyone, over giving, overdoing, striving for all this perfectionism, that we learned that that was uh, the way to be and that that was being loving. And yet when you really think about it, if you're saying yes, when you really want to say no, I mean, is that actually being loving? Kind of no. We're really just giving people like corrupted intel about what we want. Mm -hmm. And really it leaves us feeling very um, empty and alone because how can anyone ever really know us if we don't tell them the truth about how we feel about things. And it doesn't mean we don't compromise in relationships. Obviously, Heather, and you know all of this, but it does mean that your preferences, just your simple preferences mm. actually matter. Yeah. And telling the people in your life what they are actually matters. Beautiful. And knowing, yes, exactly. And knowing, just saying it out loud. Right. Like you said, just communicating that um, in order to be like, this has value. How can we how can we co-create this together? Um, so much that I want to say, <laughs> I'm like, where to start? They're definitely going to have to get your book and follow you and dive deeper into your work, because, again, it's not a one and done. It's not one time conversation. It's a practice. It's a learning. It's a new language. Yeah. What, when people are in it, right, it's, it's the fear sometimes of disappointing others or, may, or ruffling feathers, all the things that people say, we're recording this right before the holiday season. So <laughs> we're headed into this where the world is opening up a little bit and people are now integrating back in to a new world. Um, and, and some of those boundaries aren't there anymore, like the physical boundaries, right? So mm -hmm. we're back into that space and there's discomfort and we're getting that feedback, that contrast, that resentment of like, oh, not this, not this, not this. Mm -hmm. So where to begin? Where to begin? You have your resentment list. You're like, okay, it's my partner. I'm overwhelmed. I have so much on my plate. What, and I, I hate when people ask me this question, so now I'm going to ask you this question. <laughs> practical strategy tips, but like where to begin to go, my whole identity has been wrapped up in being this good person, being the star student. Mm -hmm. And now I understand, I can see it and I can feel it, that this boundary needs to be implemented and I'm freezing. I think that you got to write it out. That mean it's so common what you're talking about, people feeling like I want to do it, but I can't, like the words won't come. So you have to make a plan. I teach you, I'll give you a little mini proactive boundary plan right now, right? So these are the steps you're going to take. You're going to get clear. That's step number one is always clarity within yourself of what boundary or what ask, what, what do I need to do? Like what isn't working? So you, you brought up, let's say with your partner, you're overwhelmed and you're doing too much. Okay, so perhaps you need to ask your partner to take over some of the things that you're doing. Okay, so let's say that's what it is. Then you want, number two, you wanna strategically decide the best time and place to have the conversation, right? And then you're gonna figure out the language. Number three is gonna be creating a script. And when I say creating a script, I don't mean you can't go off that script. I mean, coming up with the words. I mean, in the book itself, Boundary Boss, I have a whole entire chapter of just scripts because that is what everybody wants from me when I talk about this, when I teach this, because so much of the time you may know exactly what the problem is. And get right to the point of having the conversation. And I can't tell you hundreds of clients at this point, thousands of students have said, I was right there. I was going to do it. Mm -hmm. And then no words would come. I just couldn't think of what to say without seeming rude or without being aggressive. So we come up with a script. So we're going to get really precise with language. So let's just get clear about, depending on the situation, your goal is to inform the other person 
of either your preference, your desire, your request, your limit. And in some cases, maybe it's a deal breaker. Maybe your partner wants to go have the holiday meal with 10 people who are not vaccinated or 20 people who are or whatever the deal is. It might be a deal breaker for you where you're like, I don't want to be in enclosed quarters or whatever. Maybe that's not a good example, but I think it is because this is what people are asking me all the time. Like what happens if I feel differently about it than someone else? So you have to stick to your own side of the street when you're creating the language. So we're never going in and being like, well, you, Bob, never do anything. You don't help. You expect all of this from me. Obviously, we're not doing that. We go in with speaking from the I point of view. And when I say stick on, you know, make sure your own side of the street is clean. I mean, you've got to get clear, get away from blaming language. And you can say, right, I have a bunch of sentence starters, but you can say, you know, you know, I'd like to make a simple request that I do the shopping and you help me with the cooking or whatever the simple request would be. I know that in the past, I've done all of this stuff, but this year I want to do something different and realize that me doing it all, I end up exhausted, right? You can provide context which is what that is. It's not convincing the other person. It's sharing information, Mm -hmm. especially if there are close people, like we want them to understand us, but then you make the request. And the, the fourth step is you've got to, before you have the conversation, right? You come up with your script. The fourth step is visualizing, having the conversation and visualizing it going well, meaning, you feel centered and grounded. You are not feeling aggressive or hostile. You might feel a little bit anxious about doing it, but it's like you see it going well. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, Heather, that everyone does what we want them to do, but there's value in having the boundary conversation regardless, because this is you standing up for yourself and allowing, at least giving the people in our lives, the opportunity to step up for us in a specific way that would make us feel loved and supported. Mm -hmm. And they will not figure that out on their own. If I left it up to my husband, he would get it wrong, even though he's the greatest. And I, you know, I have a great marriage. We've been together 25 years, but I am so specific about what I need (laughs) <laughs> because if I just let him guess, he, I love him, but he'll get it wrong. That's a fact, you know? Yeah. Yes. And I think I love how you are saying this with be specific, be specific. And sometimes the reason why people are like, I don't know what I want. <laughs> and it's like, well, if you don't know what that's yeah. going to look like, how do you expect somebody else to read your mind? Exactly. And that's why step one is always clarity within yourself. Mm. And and I feel like we live in this, this world of this like instant gratification. If it isn't easy, if I don't know it exactly, take a minute, write down your resentment list. And in doing that process, write down why. Be granular. What is really happening Mm -hmm. for you. Because the truth is we do know clients, a lot of times people on the internet and everywhere, clients will be like, how do I know if a boundary has been crossed? Right. They're like, if this seems so overwhelming, I feel confused. Mm -hmm. And I'll always say, listen, you know, even if you couldn't, you know, what you said before, Heather, you said, you know, sometimes people freeze, even if you freeze in the moment, your body has alerted you that something is up right? You feel that flash of anger. Let's say somebody at work or somebody in your your family, a friend, makes a comment that you think is like kind of mean. Maybe you don't confront it at the time, but trust me, your body reacted the second that came out of Betty's mouth. Yeah. You had that constriction in your chest. Maybe you got hot. Maybe you started to sweat. And even if you didn't do it in the moment, because listen, reacting in um, present moment, like right now, that takes a little bit of mastering the art of boundaries before you can do it because we're so, 
trained and used to either letting things go, right? But making a mental note, putting it in the uh, resentment file cabinet. Trust me, we know what that person said. <laughs> we, are, we are holding it against them inside. Right. Or if you don't have good self-control, you may react and explode in the moment. And then you may say something you regret, right? You may say something mean back, mm -hmm. which you probably don't want to, right? You, there's one thing to draw a boundary and say, hey, that's not cool. And it's different to let somebody sort of lower your own level of integrity by like climbing into the mud with them. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And then getting, yeah, it just stews and stews and stews and then you explode again. And mm -hmm. then the cycle continues. Lis listening to you, I am reflecting on how much I had to re like learn boundaries with myself um, more than other people. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, so it was eight years ago this year when I was diagnosed with a stage four um, sporadic Burkitt's and none of that, none of the cancer worlds even exists. It like, I don't even think about it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to that, I remember pre-cancer when I was starting my business and I had my little babies and I did have boundaries with other people. I would want, I'd be like, Oh, I'm not available. I'm not available. I would still feel guilty, but I would, mm -hmm. I would, you know, like the residue was there, but I could hold that. But, Oh dang, the mental boundaries. Can we talk about this a little bit? Like, mm -hmm. the, like getting to like the, I guess this would be like advanced level, but the mental boundaries of watching, you know, that thought or that self doubt come up and like grabbing onto it, not having a boundary there or the energy boundaries. So learning how to co-create with my body and my energy, my mental, physical, emotional, spiritual energy of really listening and going, you pushed it today. Like you did that. Nobody else did that to you. I could take ownership, but I push, 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 push. So now I'm like, mm, no, doesn't work, doesn't work. I get it now, but I didn't realize that was boundaries, but it was more like internal boundaries. Does that make that's, sense? Yeah, that's, and, and in fact, Heather, that's exactly what they're called. The way that you relate to yourself, where you fall down or stand up for yourself, those are your internal boundaries. And actually the truth is that it's not really advanced because the way that I teach it in the book, the way that I teach it in my course is that, that is a, you know, that's part of almost the beginning of the process is breaking down the different kinds of boundaries, mm -hmm. you know, mental, emotional, uh, physical, sexual, and material. But then understanding that our boundaries with ourselves, just like you described, we really need to look at where are we not following through on what we say we're going to do for ourselves. And having a dis having disordered boundaries with ourselves mm. create disordered boundaries with others, right? Because then we overcommit or we say yes when we want to say no, or we don't tell the truth about how we feel if we're upset about something. And that all has to do with our relationship to ourself, where we have to put all of this emphasis on self-care and self-love in a real way where you know you hear about self-love like on the interweb and all over the place and it's so vague it's like you know just like love yourself more you know and I always look at that and go that's not helpful at all mm -hmm. because people need to know what does that look like and that looks like holding yourself in high regard and that looks like not like like having enough self-esteem to not put up with a bunch of crap from other people, to not allow people to disrespect us, our time, our energy, um, make assumptions about us. Um, these are all ways that self-love is so much more than a feeling. It's literally a way of life, according to me. It's how we interact in our relationships. But again, it's how we think about ourselves. So if we think that we should work until we're like on the ground 
or we should overfunction, even though other people are not doing their share and we're exhausted and we allow ourselves to get sick or run down. I can't tell you how many women would end up in my therapy practice when they're so to the point of burnout yeah. that they have autoimmune disorders and TMJ and insomnia. And then, you know, if menopause hits or they're, they're having kids and you've got a lot of hormonal imbalance, mm-hmm. you just get to a point where you're on your knees, where you're like, I literally cannot do this anymore. But it's like your body makes you stop. Because your audience, I think, is probably very similar to mine, which they're highly capable. Yeah. So we just keep going until something happens. And I'm sure, I imagine, having a cancer diagnosis was some kind of a wake-up call for you, as it was for me many years ago, where you don't listen, you don't listen. I definitely felt like my own diagnosis, I had two different kinds of thyroid cancer, but that diagnosis changed the trajectory of my life. Yeah. Right. Like in respect to boundaries, how I felt about myself, my relationships, who was in the VIP section of my life. There were all of these things that thinking about mortality Mm -hmm. made me go, wait, am I actually living my best life? And the answer was no, (laughs) definitely not. But it, it created an urgency to figure a lot of this stuff out. And so, I mean, as my friend Chris Carr would say, I won't call it a gift because I wouldn't want to give it to you or anybody else, Mm. but it did profoundly impact the urgency that I felt to figure out all of this mental wellness stuff. Yeah. 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 I think urgency is such a beautiful, a beautiful thing. What, however life brings that to you more in a natural way would be great <laughs> rather than a, an illness or disease yeah. or, tra- or trauma. Um, the interesting part about that was that wasn't my switch. That was like the needle that broke the, or ne- whatever. Yeah. Camel's um, back. <laughs> yeah. Parenting was my first like bottom. I was like, mm. okay, wake up. And that was nine years before my diagnosis. But I will tell you, and I know you are friends with Danielle Laporte, Mm -hmm. her desire map came out, was right when I was diagnosed. And it had such big influence on me because I literally reversed engineered how I wanted to feel. So I read the book right before my diagnosis. And I was like, yeah, I love this. I love all this personal development stuff. And then I was like, okay, great. Now, what are you going to do? How do you want to feel? What do you need to do today to feel the way you want to feel? And I just kept repeating that, repeating that, repeating that, repeating that, and bringing myself back to life. It's and- so funny that you say that though, Heather, because I always reference Dan, you know, th- that exact book um, mm-hmm. with if I had had the desire map mm-hmm. in my 20s, in my younger life, I probably would have left entertainment years sooner. I kept thinking that, you know, getting to the next level of success was going to make me feel the way I wanted to feel. And then I would get there and not feel that what I wanted to feel. And I, if I had known how to reverse engineer it, because Danielle Laporte would have taught me. <laughs> so I can totally like the timing for you sounds like it was just perfect. It was. And it's yeah, it's just it's just interesting how life works. And yet that's boundaries, right? Yes. Like boundaries to. Because then the next thing that comes in, people will say, I don't have time for this. Mm -hmm. I don't have time for this. I'm like, you don't have time to feel good. So what do you say when those excuses start to come in as people are implementing those boundaries? Life is so busy. We can't even have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Have the script, but we can't have the conversation. Things get in the way. Mm. Well, here's the thing. I always say, I would always say to my clients, well, I wonder if at the end of 30 days, if you had four boundary conversations that you know you need to have at the end of 30 days, you could do it within 30 days. But if I was going to give you $5 million in cash, I wonder if you could find the time. Mm. Because people do what they want to do. Yeah. And it sometimes takes, and certainly for me, because wow, I'm stubborn and was in my life, you know, sometimes it takes really being brought to 
your knees to be like, okay, something really does have to change. I love to tell the, you know, the different painful stories and I share them in the book of experiences I had in my life to try to say, hey, I had cancer twice. I was held up at gunpoint. I had all these experiences, but, and that led me to realizing what needed to change in my life. You don't have to have those things happen to you. Yeah. You can literally learn. I wrote a whole book about it. You can learn from my experience and not wait until you are on your knees or you might need to, because I, nobody could have told me, you know, Heather, prior to, I learned the way that I needed to learn. I don't think someone could have inspired me to do it differently or do it sooner. Although I do hope, and I can tell you from the thousands of people who are reading this book and, you know, sharing their experiences mm -hmm. that I've, I hope I have saved some from having the deepest, darkest moments. And yet sometimes we need to feel them. So it depends on your tolerance level, you know, like how bad does it need to get yeah. before you have the conversation and realize that you are not that fragile. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And if we can feel the contrast so deeply, we can handle that uncomfortable conversation and shake our way through it. Right. And on the other side, though, th this is the, the hard part in the beginning before you start the process of actively and mindfully making, requ making requests in your life, drawing boundaries, setting limits with folks. You only know what you're giving up which is a lot of projection and a lot of fear, right? We fear that we're going to give up our good girl status or our superwoman status or the person that, you know, the status that everyone can come to you and you're always available to help or whatever the thing is. And you don't yet know what you're gaining, but what you're gaining is liberation, joy, doing things because you really want to, much deeper intimacy in your life, when we really allow others to add value, when we delegate more effectively, when we ask for help, when we need it, mm. it changes the quality of your relationships in such a way that it's so funny because I hear from people being like, oh my God, now I love it. I'm searching for people to draw boundaries with. <laughs> like I'm doing it with my siblings and my partner, but now I'm literally finding people because it's so awesome. <laughs> Mm hmm. And then you see it all over the place mm -hmm. that it's you're mastering this art. It's a new language. So once you understand the language, you see things very differently, right? You're you're looking at people's businesses. You're walking into businesses. You're having conversations with people and you're like, oh, my gosh, you need boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so true. You see it everywhere. But a thing that you learn, though, is that being proactive Mm. And, and as many of us are high functioning codependents, as I call it, where, you know, we're always dialed into what's going on with other people. And we're so proactive to make sure that this person has what they need. And this person has what they need. And I don't sit these two next to each other at dinner because they don't like it. Like we're yeah. so dialed in, but you can be, instead of being proactive in that way, which is kind of dysfunctional, we can be proactive with boundaries. Mm -hmm. We can anticipate the problems, you know, we can go, oh yeah, last year this happened. Let me see, how can I be proactive? Oh, I can either not invite Uncle Bob because he's a drunk and there's always a problem, or I can, whatever, you know, like we can come up with real ways of having real boundaries mm -hmm. and just giving yourself permission to not do what you've always done if you have been um, an over-functioner right? An over-deliverer, an over-giver in your life. It's okay to not do those things. And even with the holidays upon us, it's like, you know, I would have clients who would do all the holidays would be at their house. Mm -hmm. They would do all the cooking. It seemed like they were also doing all the cleaning up. And I was like, dude, it's completely unnecessary. Do it as a potluck and don't invite the people who feel in touch. Like, we have to give ourselves permission to change and to really value our own feelings. If it isn't joyful, if you're just checking a box, if you're doing it because you've always done it, because other people expect you to do it, 
it's time to rethink what you want to do and what can you do lovingly. If whatever you're doing leaves you feeling resentful, put upon, exhausted, then you're doing it from a disordered place. You're doing it out of fear. It's not the same as doing it out of love. It really isn't. Because if you end up bitter, right, or angry, I mean, you don't think that all of these moms, we hear about, you know, all these martyred moms, like as if they're all older. You don't think that they started out being like, can't wait to become a martyr. Exactly. Of course not. (laughs) But they did too much for too long with the expectation that then people would eventually owe them. Yeah. And that is the wrong point of view. That is that is having disordered boundaries and then feeling owed. And how bad does that feel? Yeah, especially if you're that child. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And you don't want to do that to your own kids because they don't want to be around you. Then you become an obligation. What fun is that? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, heck, go live your life. It's not my responsibility. You gave me everything. You had nothing left in your tank for you. Yeah, man. I always say this to to parents. I always uh, reference the the book, The Prophet. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, and I mean, it was originally written, I think in 1923. I have no idea how that guy could have so much insight (laughs) that long ago. But when you think about it, you know, we don't own our kids, you know, like we are, we are honored To ferret them through the first 18, 20, 22 years of their lives. But we are the bows and they are the arrows and we are supposed to be preparing them to go. Mm -hmm. And that means having exactly what you said, Heather, that means having your own freaking life. Because if not, you end up becoming an obligation to your grown kids that they really don't necessarily want to be around you. They Mm -hmm. feel obligated what a bummer. Like I, I really have worked hard to not have that be the case. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, I love this conversation. And again, I love how you just said, um, earlier, you know, this, here's the book, here's the lessons, here's the teachings you get to choose. Like, do you want to learn them now? Or do you need to wait until something horrid happens or you're at, you know, on your knees And shifting the conversation to after, the other side, the love, the liberation, the freedom that you gain to choose. Um, When you get to that other side, I want to talk about, like, I love currently in my life, I feel like maybe 10 years ago, I I still definitely needed hardcore boundaries, needed to learn and uh, master the language of boundaries because... I would be triggered by people that would have mm-hmm. like good boundaries. And on the other side of that, I understand what it is now and didn't know. But back then the trigger was I needed more boundaries. <laughs> which I, I was triggered by people with, with boundaries. I now love being in relationship with people who have boundaries, friends, people I'm you know, doing business with. I absolutely love it. There's no anger. There's no resentment. It's clean. It's clear. So talking about the possibilities of that, how like you today, Terry, like writing a book on boundaries, how do you interact with people in the world? Do you still find yourself needing to uh, strengthen some of your boundaries? I'm just curious being on the other side. Yes. I mean, listen, I like you, my most cherished relationships are with the people I can be myself the most with, the people I trust the most, which means I have good boundaries and they have good boundaries. I, I tell a story in the book about my friend Elizabeth Dialto, who is, um, I, was, I was doing something, I don't know, I was going to some, some retreat in Guatemala or something. And I was like, hey, do you wanna do this thing? She's like, nah, I hate Guatemala, I hate hot places. Anyway, I um, hope you have fun. Like for not a second. I love that. Would she be weird and be like, well, it's not you. And it's cause I just, she is truthful. Mm. So, and I love not wasting time. I, I can't stand a whole long, if you say no to something, I'm okay with that. That's okay. And you don't have to conv- convince me that you have a right. And my friends who know that are the people I'm most comfortable 
being around, I think that the people, for most of us, that it's the most difficult to not fall back into old patterns is our family of origin. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, if you imagine that healthy boundaries, right? And the boundaries that we have with people, they're like a dance. So those people are like your original dance troupe. And so it's really easy um, when, especially if there's a trauma, it's like in my family of origin, I'm sort of the hero child. Mm -hmm. And so I've gotten much healthier in the many decades and then something will happen. My mother was diagnosed with cancer. She's okay, but thank God. But I found myself, you know, over-functioning, doing everything, do like, you know, sort of boxing out my sisters. I have three older sisters, right? There's no way that this needed to fall on me. And then ultimately it didn't, but my first reaction was an old reaction. It was a super high functioning codependent reaction. I'm going to do all the things and find all the, you know, you know, I was healthy enough to come back to, okay, that doesn't make sense. And hi, you're writing a book, so you can't (laughs) do all of these things. But I find that my clients will tell me, you know, they go home for the holidays and that they can suddenly be acting like their 12 year old self, you know? So it's being really mindful of who you're interacting with. And I also have to say that my family of origin has been incredibly flexible. My mother who's 84 will listen to anything, can change her mind about things. Mm -hmm. So I feel grateful that they are my original dance troupe because at least we can talk about things Mm -hmm. and um, clear the air about things or, you know, change what we're doing. But I think that no matter how well you know this language, creating boundaries is an emotional experience. The more you do it, the easier it gets. And you will always, it's a discipline. So I always say to my clients, I want you to think about it like going to the gym. You know, you are not going to get the tush of your dreams by going to the gym once. Like this is not how it works and probably not even why you're going, Mm -hmm. right? We want to be physically healthy so that we can live a good life. But we know that that's an ongoing process. And I feel the same with healthy boundaries and mastering this art and this language. It's an ongoing process. Yes. Oh, Yes, yes, yes. Terry, where can people get more of you? Your book, um, I know you have a little something for the listeners. I do. Okay, so you can get the book. I mean, go to terrycole.com, right? So that's that's where you can find everything. But I do have, um, you can get the book and then claim these beautiful bonuses that I created for you at boundarybossbook.com. So just wherever you get the book and you just put it in and then you'll get access to a bunch of bonuses and meditation and stuff that I'm still giving. You know, you're supposed to stop giving them, but I feel like I made them and I want you to have them. And I also created um, something for your audience and it is about codependency because I find that this is something that is misunderstood endlessly, especially by people who identify as female. So to get that gift, it's a video and a downloadable guide. So you can sort of see where you are on the codependency spectrum. You're gonna go to boundaryboss.me forward slash M-I-I-C. Perfect, awesome. And Terry is T-E-R-R-I. Yep, C-O-L-E. And that's that's me on Instagram as well. That's where I hang out the most. And I also have a podcast, The Terry Cole Show, which has been around for six years. We just passed three and a half million downloads. So feel free to check that out if you want to know all the things mental health. Awesome. Terry, thank you so much for your brilliance, your genius, your time. Um, and everyone, go grab that book because we all need it. Thanks for having me, Heather. Hello. My name is Cass, and I am the owner and principal designer of Cass Design Studio in LaSalle, Ontario. I found Heather, I feel like I watched her video, her TEDx Windsor um, 15 minute uh, speech that came across social media at one point or another. And then I got my hands on her book, Dying to Be a Good Mother. And from there, I just, I knew I had to work with her. I joined Mastery Business because I knew I needed something to join both worlds. 
Uh, I had a lot going on personally and just chaotic thoughts and all of these things happening and the way that it was affecting my business. There's no way that I could have only worked on my business without working on myself. The things that have changed the most for me, I think is really just my attitude (laughs) and, um, at the deeper level is my anger is gone. I didn't realize how much anger and resentment and grief I was holding on to. That again was playing a huge role in my daily life. And that specifically to me is, is what changed. So let alone, you know, all of the habits and the self-awareness and all of that, I am very pleased to say that my anger is gone and I can cultivate, you know, more positive emotions and more positive energy into all aspects of things. Well, that's it. And I wanted to thank you for listening today because I truly believe you are exactly where you need to be. And now I have a favor to ask. In exchange for the value you've gained from this free podcast, I'd be forever grateful if you would leave us a review on iTunes. Share the show with at least one woman in your life who you feel would benefit and or take a screenshot and share it on social media. And always feel free to tag me at Heather Chauvin. The world does not benefit from your guilt and fatigue. The world needs more women who are willing to unlearn everything they've been taught. Women who are courageous enough to feel good and not let guilt run the show. I believe you are that courageous woman. To see if my community and coaching is the right fit for you and your big vision, the relationships you desire, the money, time, energy that you know deep down you are capable of creating, then head on over to heatherchauvin.com forward slash work with me. That's Heather Chauvin, C-H-A-U-V-I-N dot com forward slash work with me and take the next step in the right direction. Taking a stand for how you feel means you are taking a stand for how your your children show up as adults. And if you have a personal question or topic you'd like me to answer on the podcast, text me 313-710-5199. 313-710-5199. You are so worthy of feeling good. Now go do some scary shit.